have the authority to do is beg regulatory officials who are not even elected, they're appointed, mm -hmm. uh, and they tend to all be straight out of the industry, to beg them to, to get the industry to cause a little less harm through the permitting process. Right. And that's not acceptable in a democratic society. Mm -hmm. Welcome to the Alliance for Democracies, the Populist Dialogues. This Populist Dialogues Cablecast program's purpose is to advance the mission of the Alliance for Democracy to create a just society based on an equitable, sustainable economy and to end corporate rule. I'm your host, David Delk. Our guest today is Paul Cienfuegos. Paul is an educator and organizer in the community rights movement, which has now come to Portland, but more on that a little later. Paul has been our guest before. In fact, he was here last week. Uh, we didn't get nearly enough discussed, so we uh, asked him to come back again this week. So welcome back to the show, Paul. Pleasure, thanks. Right. Good, good. So uh, let's just summarize a little bit of our conversation uh, from last week just to bring people up. Uh, and I will say that if, uh, if you want to go back and see what we talked about last week, you can go to our YouTube channel at YouTube, uh, no, it's at, uh, yes, at youtube.com slash populist dialogues and, and you'll be able to watch the, uh, watch the first part of this two-part series. So uh, just summarize what's community rights or uh, what is the community rights movement? So it's a new movement in the United States that's about 13 years old. Um, and it's a movement of communities that, are, that have grown sick and tired of the state and federal government telling them that they don't have the legal right at the city or county level to pass laws that simply protect the health and welfare of the community and its local environment, and have grown sick and tired of corporations pushing around local communities and putting in industrial and, and, and commercial developments that the city doesn't want. Mm -hmm. Toxic, you know, toxic dumps, big box stores, etc. cetera. So um, it's gotten to the point now that over the last 13 years, there are 150 communities, including one major city, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, in nine states um, that have passed these laws that are legally binding. And I'm the lead organizer in this state of Oregon and uh, have been very active for the last year and a half right Great. here. Uh, <coughs> talk just for a moment about, uh, last time we talked about the regulatory box. How's the regulatory box? What, what, what are we talking about? The reg regulatory law structure was created in the 1880s um, through conversations in private between the U.S. Attorney General and railroad company executives to create this small box, basically, for we the people to have to stand in um, when we are uh, concerned or outraged about corporate harms. Um, and, and for the last century, it has, the system has worked so well that every industrial sector has gotten its own regulatory, uh, a, 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 its own regulatory agency. Mm -hmm. so and these agencies, uh, publicly, when they're formed, are formed uh, at least in terms of the, the, the PR that goes out before. Uh, is that this is a way that we, the people, regulate the industry? But in fact, it's the other way around. This is the way that industry is actually regulating us. Regulating us. us. My colleague Jane Ann Morris says the primary purpose of environmental regulations is the regulating of environmentalists. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I think that's absolutely right. right. Is that environmentalists don't have the authority under conventional law to say, we don't want this toxic sludge dumped on our farmland. We don't want this clear cut. We don't want this big box store. We don't want this river dammed, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. All we have the authority to do is beg regulatory officials who are not even elected, they're appointed, mm -hmm. uh, and they tend to all be straight out of the industry to beg them to, to get the industry to cause a little less harm through the permitting process. Right. And that's not acceptable in a democratic society. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, the woman's name again, and what was the name of her book? Jane Ann Morris mm -hmm. um, wrote a great book called Gaveling Down the Rabble. Um, she's a Madison, Wisconsin author, and um, it's about the use of the Commerce Clause of the U.S. Constitution to basically give corporations a phenomenal s selection of rights mm -hmm. that they use against us. Right. And I read that book years ago, and it is a, a mind-opening uh, book, and so I highly recommend it to our audience. It's, it's kind of hard to get. So I definitely it's actually have really to easy to get. Really? I okay. carry it here in town. Oh, okay. Um, I carry all of the key books on democracy and corporations in stock in my bookstore, 100fires.com, 100fires.com. Uh -huh. Okay, all right, yeah, good. I have copies in stock today. Okay, good. Well, I highly recommend folks contact Paul and get that book and read it and understand it. Um, so uh, m moving forward, uh, 
the movement originally centered in Pennsylvania has now moved across the country. You talked uh, last week about what had happened in Spokane. Uh, I know that they also were involved with writing or rewriting the Constitution in Ecuador. Yes. Um, so basically, I work in partnership with a group called the Community Environmental Legal oh, yeah. Defense Fund, or CELDF, C-E-L-D-F dot org is their website. They're a public interest law firm that is the group that helps these 150 and climbing communities to write these specific local ordinances. And again, the, the ordinances do three very specific things. They strip corporations of their so-called constitutional rights, what many people know as corporate personhood. They strip state and federal nullification laws from saying you can't pass these laws to protect yourself because that violates state or federal laws. They strip state and federal allowing to do that. Mm -hmm. um, and they ban specific corporate activities. And so uh, what happened was that starting in Pennsylvania 13 years ago, um, these rural conservative farm communities kept banning corporate agriculture one after another until there were about 20 of them that had done this. And all, pretty much all of those first 20 ordinances included rights of nature language, recognizing that, that nature isn't just private property, it has inherent rights of its own. Um, and farmers got to, they started to understand that because of the way environmental law works in this country, where, where environment is literally considered property, and so whoever owns the property can destroy the environment they own, mm -hmm. that they actually were in a stronger position legally as farmers if they gave, if they recognized that nature had inherent rights, because then everybody had legal standing to defend nature, not just people who <laughs> had some financial interest in nature being protected. Because mm -hmm. right now, under conventional environmental law, you have to prove standing, which means a financial interest, which is kind of insane if you think about mm -hmm. it. So um, in Ecuador, about I don't know five or six years ago. There was some pretty revolutionary stuff happening there, and indigenous people got involved politically at a scale that they never had before, and they elected their own, they elected an indigenous man to be the, the, the president of the country, and they elected many of their own people to parliament. And they rewrote their federal constitution so that it included for the first time a rights of nature section. It was the first national constitution in world history where nature was recognized to have inherent rights to thrive and evolve. And fa uh, f the, fantastically enough, the reason, one of the reasons they even did this is that these native leaders in Ecuador had heard about what was happening in rural conservative Pennsylvania. Hmm. And they invited Pennsylvania farmers and Thomas Lindsay, the director of Community Environmental Legal Defense Fund, to Ecuador to consult them about how you put rights of nature into law. I call this reverse colonialism. That's my uh, own term uh, yeah, for Yeah, I was just, uh, yeah, it is. <laughs> I was just thinking how, how odd it is that, uh, that Americans would be called into yeah. you know, third world countries to uh, suggest how their constitutions to, should be written. To actually help. Uh, to, actually to actually help. To actually be helpful. Right, yes. <laughs> and so um, overwhelming support in the, in the national parliament of Ecuador to pass this new constitution, and then it went through a popular vote. You know, it didn't, when we pass a new constitution, it doesn't go through a popular vote in no. this country. It, it does there, overwhelming national popular vote to support the new constitution. And then just a year or two ago, the first test of this new uh, rights of nature legislation, um, a county in Ecuador had built a road along a wild river called the Yolcabamba River, and um, two individuals who were residents of that county sued the county government, brought the case to the Supreme Court, uh, representing the rights of, representing the river, mm -hmm. uh, and, and um, accusing the county of seriously damaging the natural flow of the river with this new road building along its edge. And the Supreme Court of Ecuador heard for the first time the first test case of the rights of nature law and the Yolcabamba River won mm. in the Supreme Court. And the county now has to spend whatever's required to put the natural flow of the river back into place. Very exciting. So that's pretty interesting. Very exciting. I don't think that there's been a rights of nature legal test yet in Pennsylvania or in the other states that have passed uh -huh. this within their local laws. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. So um, you said that there were seven groups of community <coughs> rights. Um, 
organizing here in the state of Oregon. Yeah. So let's talk about some of those and what they've been doing. So my primary work, and I'd love to come to your community if you're listening to this, you know, or watching this on YouTube or whatever, is um, I do introductory workshops, and that's how five of these seven communities launched, is they came and, and attended my introductory workshop in their town. Um, it starts with Benton County, which is Corvallis's county in okay. the Willamette Valley, where about a year and a half, two years ago, I led an introductory workshop where I, I where I introduced a, a food bill of rights ordinance that had been drafted by Seldeth for another community, but it hadn't been used anywhere yet. Um, and a bunch of farmers, uh, I, I, I organized this actually myself at the Corvallis Food Co-op, and about 45 people, mostly farmers, showed up. And six farmers from Benton County literally walked right out of the workshop together, went to a pub across the street, and start and said to each other, we're going to do this. Mm -hmm. This is urgent. Let's get this thing going. And out of that was formed the Benton County Community Rights Coalition, which just a few weeks ago finalized its local ordinance, which it calls a sustainable food system ordinance, and, uh, and filed it with the county elections office in Benton County. Um, and there's a, there's a count, the, the county's attorney has a personal grudge against this ordinance, and so he's trying to stop it from going to the ballot box next May. So there's a legal battle taking place right now. We'll see, mm -hmm. you know, what happens with that. But if you want to know more about the Benton County Ordinance, you can go to bentonccrc.org. That's their website. Mm -hmm. Um, a few months later, um, I introduced this work to a group of folks in Lane County, which is Eugene's County in the Lambeth Valley. And they just this last week um, filed their local food system ordinance. That's what it's called. And you can look at their work at communityrightslanecounty.org. Um, I was one of the founders of the group here in Portland. We have a website that's just gone up this month finally called communityrightspdx.org. Mm -hmm. And we just in the last month or two have decided to launch two countywide ballot initiative campaigns, hopefully for the November 2014 ballot. One is going to be um, fashioned on the Lane County s Local Food System Ordinance. It will ban all GMO agriculture countywide in Multnomah County if it passes. And a second is a fair elections ordinance, which um, our goal is to strip um, the right of corporations or wealthy individuals to give substantial donations to uh, city or county government mm -hmm. or to impact ballot initiatives in any way. Um, and to also ban, it would, it, if we, we think it would also ban uh, any uh, secret meetings, any private meetings between corporate representatives and local or county government. Mm -hmm. So some kind of fair elections ordinance. So we have drafts of already of both of them already in the works, and we hope to launch both of them this fall. Okay. And in Portland, we're doing two major events in September uh, where we're going to be talking about and launching these two ordinances, and we're going to have Thomas Lindsay in town, who's the founding director and lead attorney at the Community Environmental Legal Defense Fund. Right, okay. And he's going to be giving speeches on both of these topics. Right, yeah. And I would highly encourage folks to come and hear Thomas Lindsay talk. We had Thomas Lindsay uh, and when I say we, I'm talking about the Alliance for Democracy, sponsored Thomas Lindsay to come to Portland probably 10 years ago and do one of his, uh, his weekend-long democracy schools, uh, similar to what you do yes. uh, in your two-day workshops. And he was absolutely phenomenal. So I really hope yeah. that people will really turn out for both of these both of these two events. Yeah, this, the first one is Saturday, September 21 in the evening at PSU's ballroom, mm -hmm. and the second is Sunday, September 22 in the main hall at the Unitarian Church in right. downtown Portland. Right. So both and of those facilities. And the second one is sponsored by your organization. Well, right, yeah. And both of those facilities hold 600 people. Uh, so hopefully we'll have 1,200 people. That would be uh, awesome. Coming to both of those and really rev this up <coughs> in, in Portland. Uh, talk more about uh, the objections on the part of the attorney in ben uh, Benton, County, Benton County, where they challenged uh, the, the initiative. Yeah, there. so this is actually the second time that they've been delayed in Benton County. Um, there is something called the single subject rule in Oregon that means that uh, when you're running a ballot initiative, it has to be on just one particular topic. It can't be on multiple topics, and this is somewhat unique to Oregon law. 
Um, the way that the ordinance was written by the Benton County. No, um, I'm going to interrupt you because I wish, I wish that Congress had a single subject law <laughs> or rule. Uh, I so know that where you're when they when they pass a piece of legislation, it actually only deals with one topic. Right. Because so often, you know, a bill, uh, an agriculture bill or a defense bill, will get loaded up with amendments that have absolutely right. nothing to do with that. So I, I'm sorry. Oh, I, didn't I we just <laughs> in the last week have a state in the South? Oh no, it was Texas, just banned uh, women's right to have a legal abortion in a motorcycle safety bill. Uh, yes, exactly. I believe. Uh, exactly, right, yeah. I mean, right, it's, yeah. it's obscene, really. Yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. No, I, I'm sorry, I digress. But <laughs> <laughs> uh, what was the question, David? <laughs> the uh, question was, uh, well, well, you were talking about the single subject uh, and the use of that by the attorney to challenge this initiative right. in uh, Benton County. So um, our attorneys at Seldeth, you know, um, rewrote the the Benton County community. At that point, it was called a Food Bill of Rights. It's now called a Sustainable Food System Ordinance in its second draft. They rewrote it so that all of the claims made by the attorney were, were fully addressed and convinced that the judge would not this time agree with the county's attorney that it violated the single subject rule. And we're still waiting to hear. But interestingly enough, I mean, this guy just kind of has a vendetta against this kind of, I mean, this is, this kind of lawmaking is really threatening to a certain, a certain kind, a certain political kind of of uh, politician or, or attorney because it challenges, it's a frontal assault against state and federal preemption and corporate rights. And so there's certain people who are really threatened by this. And I don't mean to imply that it's a left, that it's a conservative, th that, th that conservatives are threatened because most of our ordinances in the country will actually come out of very conservative rural communities. So it's not a left versus right uh, movement at all. Mm -hmm. In fact, the right is is the are the heroes really of most of these um, these wins so far. But this particular and when you attorney, say left and right, you're really talking about in the traditional sense that we think of those terms. And uh, I and, and I get really tired of those terms. Uh, quite uh, yeah, 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 uh, yeah. And, and I, I think you know, think in terms of the history of uh, you know going back to the populist movement, which is kind of really where this all starts. Yes. Uh, that was. Uh, again, very conservative farmers that yeah. were challenging their power of corporations, exactly. unions and, or not unions, uh, railroads uh, yeah. and banks to control their economic destiny. Exactly. Right. And trying to create a national party uh, yeah. that challenged corporate power. Right. Yeah. Uh, right. So this is, you know, this has this intellectual um, long history. History. Mm -hmm. Right. The, the attorney, the county's attorney in Benton County, in the very first legal challenge, he filed two legal briefs. With the uh, with the judge, and believe it or not, one of his legal briefs argued that the Benton County Community Rights Coalition was a terrorist organization <laughs> under the FBI's definition of a terrorist organization, and he confused our work with the Sovereign Citizens Movement, which is a very different kind of movement. Mm -hmm. But he was paying so little attention to what we're doing, where we're trying to build majority support. I mean, none of our ordinances move forward unless a majority of the electeds or a majority of the public votes yes. This is not an individual rights movement at all. It's a community rights mm -hmm. movement, which he seems to fail, to completely fail to understand mm -hmm. with this charge of, of, um, of terrorism. It's pretty amazing. Uh, yeah. So and that's and his value around what we're doing. Okay. And, and, and this charge of of being a terrorist organization, has that dropped off, of, or is that still? It uh, wasn't uh, in his latest brief challenging our rewritten um, sustainable food system uh -huh. ordinance. Okay. And now we're waiting to hear what the judge says this time. The only legal challenge that's allowed in this state to, to stop a ballot initiative from even being voted on, let alone being sued after it's voted on, is the single subject rule. That's the only thing he's allowed to use. Mm -hmm. So that's, again, what he's, what he's using. Okay. But we're convinced that this does not violate the single subject okay. rule. The Lane County ordinance was filed just a few days ago, uh, and they only have the county has five days to either forward it to the elections office to put it on the ballot this coming May 2014, mm -hmm. or to challenge it again. We don't know. We we think this one's going to go right through. Right. Yeah. So uh, well, by the time this program actually airs, we'll know. We'll know. One way or another. That's right. right. Okay, right. So uh, hopefully it will go right through and we can have a, we can have a vote. We'll Let have the vote. people vote. Exactly. <laughs> Let the people because, decide. And the judges have always stood 
really at, at this in local and state ballot initiative making, judges have always tended to stand with the people's right to at least get it voted on. Mm -hmm. The argument in court is it's not illegal or unconstitutional when it's just a proposal. It becomes right. illegal or unconstitutional, the claim can be made once it's voted on exactly. with an affirmative vote. Right. Then you can sue. But to stop the public from even voting is really a d an outrage mm -hmm. against yeah. the democratic process. Yeah. Uh, talk about what happened in Las Vegas, New Mexico. So last year, the first community ever in New Mexico to pass a community rights ordinance was Las Vegas, a small community in northern New Mexico. Um, they banned fracking. And the city council passed it. The mayor was so opposed that he threatened to sue. They basically threatened to sue themselves to stop it. <laughs> Um, but it passed, and for the last, like, at least six months, maybe a year already, the mayor has been refusing to sign off on the, on the bill, which passed by majority. Mm -hmm. um, and it's normally just a formality. The mayor has to sign it, and then it becomes law, and he's refusing to sign it. And so there's an increasing effort by the community to oust the mayor because he's violating their, their authority as we the people. Mm -hmm. right? The law was passed, you know, through the legal process. Um, so, so he he's he's assuming a unauthorized power of veto. That's right. Okay. Which he doesn't have. That's that would be like having a monarch. He's acting as a monarch. Uh, right. That's right. Mm -hmm. And then just a few months ago, the very first county in in U.S. history ever to pass um, a comprehensive community rights ordinance, Mora County, New Mexico, which is mostly Chicano and Indigenous people, small county. I mean, large, geographically large, but very few people. Uh -huh. um, they, um, their county supervisors needed to pass what was being proposed by, by a, a majority of their three supervisors, so they needed two votes to get it passed. Mm -hmm. They only had one vote. So last year, uh, an individual ran for the first time again in U.S. history, ran to be elected to county government on a community rights platform promising to vote yes on the on this ordinance if elected and he was elected mm -hmm. and now they have the second vote of three and they passed the community uh, it's called the community uh, water rights and local self-government ordinance for the first time it bans all hydrocarbon removal from the ground countywide so it bans fracking oil drilling and coal mining from wow. the ground that's wow. never happened anywhere in the country before oh very interesting and this was in New Mexico also. In Mora County, New Mexico. Right. Okay, good. Yeah, and sure. that made national headlines. I don't know why, s mo most of what we do barely makes the press. Mm -hmm. From Democracy Now! to NPR to Fox, it's just missing in action. Mm -hmm. But for some reason, the Mora County story made the press. Hmm. And a bunch of attorneys in five different states contacted Seldiff and said, I will help to defend this bill, uh -huh. this law. Okay, all right. Um, we have uh, less than five minutes, okay. so uh, I, I again will offer you, you know, a couple minutes to do a kind of a, okay. a summary uh, statement. Well, um, so I just want to encourage people to get involved in the community rights movement. If you live here in Portland, um, you can go to communityrightspdx.org and find out about our twice a month introductory two-hour orientation workshops which is how we ask you to start in your involvement with us. Once you go to an orientation workshop, you're welcome to join our group, which meets weekly. Um, we need, we're going to need a lot of help to run these ordinance campaigns in Portland over the next year. And um, if you live in other parts of the, or of the state or in the country, um, please invite me, Paul Cienfuegos, to come out and introduce this work in your community. I'm, I'm the lead organizer in Oregon for the community rights movement. There are very few of us doing this work full-time on the West Coast at all. Mm -hmm. um, and we're moving very rapidly. We're 150 communities in nine states have now passed these legally binding ordinances that are directly enforceable by we the people at the local level. That's also pretty rare for laws. We usually hey, beg our electeds to enforce laws. Right, yes. We get to enforce yes. these laws. Very crucial. That strip very corporations crucial point. of their rights. Mm -hmm and ban harmful corporate activities and push back on state and federal lawmaking that says that we don't have the authority locally to govern ourselves. Mm -hmm. We call we say that's bull, and um, we're moving forward in 150 communities. Okay, great, yeah. Uh, you're going to be doing some two-day workshops also. Yeah, I lead two-day intensives around the country. Um, haven't done one in Portland lately, but I will be doing one in October and November. Okay. And you can go to my website calendar at paulcienfuegos.com to sign up.
Okay, excellent. Thank yeah. you very much for being here again. Really lovely. All right, Thanks. great, good. Our guest today has been Paul Seenfagel. Paul is an educator and organizer in the community rights movement residing here in Portland. Contact Paul via email at paul at 100fires.com. Also, more information on the community rights movement is available on the Community Environmental Legal Defense Fund website at www.celdf.org. Uh, as mentioned, Paul is helping to organize two upcoming events in Portland with Tom Lindsay, uh, the founder of Community Environmental Legal Defense Fund. Paul will be in Portland spe for speaking events on September 21st and 22nd. On the 21st, he'll be at Portland State. His topic will be sustainable food and GMOs. His second event will be on Sunday, September 22nd at the First Unitarian Church. This second event is sponsored by the Alliance for Democracy. The topic will be Why Not Local Democracy? More details on both events will be available soon on the Alliance for Democracy website and our Facebook page. But please go ahead and mark your calendars now. September 21 at Portland State and September 22nd at the First Unitarian Church. Don't forget you can watch Populist Dialogues on YouTube. Go to youtube.com slash populist dialogues to view the most recent past shows. And when you're there, click the subscribe button so that when a new program is uploaded, you will automatically receive an update uh, notice. If you're watching YouTube, maybe you can help us expand our viewership. Just contact your local cable access station and see what is required for you to sponsor a weekly broadcast of our program. Most local stations are looking for good materials and will welcome the suggestion. Populist Dialogues is a project of the Portland Alliance for Democracy. Learn more about us at afd-pdx.org and about our national organization at thealliancefordemocracy.org. We want to thank our volunteers for donating their time getting our program on the air one more time. So thank you to Roger Bates, Dave King, Janet Morris, and Tom Thomas. And thanks to all of you for watching. I hope we'll see you again next week. Bye. Thank you.